must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hey, everybody, and thanks for listening to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. And before we get to our episode today with Jack Chu, I wanted to take a moment to share this really, really good opportunity that Jack has actually offered to all of you. Now, as you'll hear throughout this episode, Jack's going to talk about um, the three R's events along with um, international physiotherapy education. And to give a little background, this event, if you want to think about it in uh, a comparative terms, it's really sort of similar to Graham sessions, yet a little bit different. Um, but Jack has actually offered um, a reduced rate for the 2019 three R's conference, either live or in virtual attendance. And what he has give, what he has done as he has offered 20% off if you use the code HET10, if you want to purchase a live seat for that event or virtual attendance. Um, now, I will admit Jack has also offered us at HET um, if a certain number of people get this, um, that we would get a free slot. But I'm going to be real honest with you. I, I mean, I, I'm not putting this out there because I want people to do this so we can get something. I, I That's really not the point of this at all. But the point is that this event is really such a unique forum in which many different people from different areas of the profession can really gather in a space to pragmatically have some really open and upfront discussions on some really pressing issues. So I highly recommend you at least check it out because I know Jack is only going to be keeping this um, deal open for a few months and I'm not sure exactly when he's going to be taking it down. Um, So just something to consider. Uh, if you are, if you want to check it out more, his website is in the show notes as well. Now, without further ado, here's our episode with Jack. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, F. Scott Field, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Brandon Pone. We have with us today a guest from across the pond. Jack Chews is the owner of Chews Healthcare in Timberley, South Manchester, providing physiotherapy and performance services also the host of the Physio Matters podcast. And as somebody who enjoys a good pun in their business, um, my business in particular is Feel Good Industries, a play on my last name. Uh, Jack Chews is also the creator of the three R's uh, conference here, which is musculoskeletal reasoning, responsibility, and reform. And Jack puts that on in the UK. Jack, if you wouldn't mind, could you tell us a little bit about your academic journey and how it brought you to where we are today? It's uh, it's a fairly it should be a fairly fast forward uh, view of uh, my academic journey because it's not very thorough. Um, I, I I went to school till sixteen and we went to what we call college uh, to eighteen. So between sixteen and eighteen, I did my A levels where you specialise a little closer to where you want to be. And for me, interestingly, and it's worth mentioning that I studied English language, biology, physical education, and media and marketing. So I had this, uh, it, I was split at that point between going into physiotherapy or going into journalism and broadcast. And, um, and so then I went into physiotherapy, did my bachelor's for three years at Nottingham University in the UK, um, managed, to, managed to persuade them to give me a degree somehow. And, and, then, and apart from a couple of uh, master's modules that I've done that haven't necessarily surmounted to an award, uh, I've done those in injection therapy, for example, or advanced practice. I've not necessarily done any um, 
any further qualification from then. Um, and so that's, that's my academic story, to be honest. But as we know, as I've just explained, I have then reverted back to some of what I learned in media marketing, English language, understanding of language, as well as the way that the profession went as I came into it um, has really stood me in good stead. So actually, I've actually found myself leaning on some of my schoolwork, um, surprising amount, really, compared to many of my colleagues. Well, you know, that's really interesting, Jack, and I appreciate all that you've done. I mean, throughout your content and all that you've done for physiotherapy across the world. So first and foremost, thank you. But I'm also kind of curious, man, what's your story with how the Physio Matters podcast even started and kind of how it led you to even like building your own company? Like, what's the kind of the, the 411 on that? Yeah, um, I, I'm not. I mean, I tried to. I tried to give you a quick one on the on the academic story because it's a short one. But I, I am not known for a short answer. I'll do my. I'll do my best on it because the. the but there were several different things, several different jigsaw pieces that for, fell into place at one time. Um, one of them being that when I started uh, my career, I was very very quickly. It was clear to me that I really wanted to get stuck into musculoskeletal practice, and 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 that was something that I specialised in relatively early in my career and so whilst I'd taken a position within a large teaching hospital large teaching trust I didn't necessarily rotate between disciplines many times before I then specialized and got a job in MSK practice and so in doing so I was always always in a hurry uh, to, to build through and, and, and also the stage in my life as well being especially at that point compared to some of my colleagues who, who had gone into physio as a second degree or later in life. I, I, was, I was in a situation where I, I certainly didn't have uh, children or a family at home. I was renting a place, mainly living in a city for work. So I was working, you know, I've, I've never, I've, I've always worked a 50 plus hour week. It's always been a fairly basic thing for me to do because of the circumstances around what I was doing. And so in doing so, I was in a hurry and then was being asked to go to offer a second opinion occasionally uh, in practice um, and, and starting to support staff fairly quickly. I was always wanting to teach. Now, it, I realized that in my day job, I was being asked for second opinions and, and then they were sometimes coming to me saying, I've got this rugby player or footballer that I volunteer or I work part time for this team. And do you mind just, can I ask you a few questions about that? And obviously I'd be like, well, maybe at lunchtime because it's not really our day job. But of course, I just had an interest. So I'd always consult. Then I realized that these people were really isolated. They were sort of lonely in practice. And I'd been in that position myself where I was doing a couple of days a week in a, a side room off a football club. So I realized that, that that lack of support and the lack of mentorship is, is a real key gap. And also, these were clubs that were spending an awful lot of money on frivolous scans or second opinions to a practice that happens to be local that's not then embedding the care and actually improving these young professionals that are coming through. So I created a consultancy service, which I called Choose Health which was sec simply me going in and sort of problem solving, speak to the coach, speak to the therapist that's there, speak to the player and just problem solve and have, help externally manage that situation, which was fairly popular um, and, and certainly saved the clubs a lot of money because they didn't end up needing this MRI or they, sometimes it was just having the back of the physio or sports therapist that was working there. So that, that was fairly popular. But again, one of the things that that, that was... Um, around the time that I was doing a lot of commuting for my day job, uh, just a boring geography lesson for everyone is I, I uh, was working in Nottingham. I lived in Sheffield and my wife lived, uh, sorry, my wife, now wife, sorry, works in Manchester where we now live. And it was a lot of commuting going on. And it just so happened that the new iPhone, I refreshed the software and it had a podcast app. I punch in physiotherapy into that and early physio edge podcasts coming out of Australia were on there. I drove down, so I found that to be useful. On the commute down to work that next day, which is an hour and 20 or something like that, I listened to an episode that made me a better clinician when I got there. It was just, it, I was just, I can't believe I didn't have to pay for that. That is incredible. That is a, a real game changing thing. And it was a podcast with a lady called Alison Grimaldi. Um, lateral hip podcast. It was just a phenomenal, I, I, was, I was a better clinician having got to work. On the way home, having been just sort of juiced up on my first podcast, I then listened to another episode that I picked from this library of nine or whatever they were. And I got home really frustrated because unlike the one on the way there, I was really frustrated at the fact that it turned out that the reason it was such a good podcast was kind of because the, the information 
um, was coming from an evidence-based sort of uh, point of view that was pragmatic and applied. And on the way home, it was kind of more frustrating because I didn't feel like the guest was being challenged appropriately or having to justify uh, their work necessarily. So I got back and I told my wife this tale of um, of, of what had happened. And, and, uh, and I said, it was just frustrating because it was clear, it's clearly such a good platform. It could do such good, but unless the questions are appropriately balanced or the relationship's not in a wrong direction commercially. And she just said, well, could you do better? And so I, I, I puffed my chest up and I thought, yeah, I bet I can. And so, uh, and that's kind of how it happened. I, I decided that I thought at the, at the, at the very least it could help me to have a, some interesting interviews with some people I really admired. But he actually, the critical angle to the interview process, especially in the UK at that time, and applying a, a critical lens, but in a polite and professional manner, was something that completely took off. I mean, we, we couldn't believe it. We put a few pilot episodes out that we just recorded ahead of time, put that on a show, especially around a time where podcasts were a little bit more sparse. So this is now five years, five and a half years ago. And, um, and so very quickly... I can't remember exactly the time frames, but I think within 18 months, we were starting to hit 20,000 downloads and episodes and stuff like that, which was, which was certainly around that time, a real surprise to all of us and made me realize that the messages that some of these brilliant people I was interviewing, they need sharing. So why not share them as broadly and as widely as we can, not just in the UK, but beyond. And you can imagine how that then did as a secondary thing, help to support and market our business within our clinical franchise, which has then grown off the back of it. So sorry, I, I did warn you it was a long answer, but I hope you can see the train of thought through that. No, it's all good because, I mean, you got to kind of get that full story about what happened there. I mean, no, you got to do that. And I appreciate that. And I mean, because it's interesting what you've done with that. And now with this new avenue, well, I guess this relatively more recent initiative that you've done with this event, with the three R's here, let's dive into that a little bit. What specifically is it and kind of how did you go about creating that and setting that thing up? Because I'm sure organizing something like that was not an overnight and easy task. No, 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 it wasn't. It was, it's something that, um, that, that and, and I'm glad I've had a chance to give you that backstory because it's super relevant to the rest of it. Otherwise it kind of goes without foundations. It sort of sounds like it just emerged, but actually what had been happening is that I, I paid attention to the fact that there was a feedback network that was being created from the guests of the podcast, but also those that were giving feedback on a regular basis through social media, grabbing me at conferences, sending us emails, writing transcripts, putting it into different languages for different people. And, and so that was all happening. I was realizing that you've got a, a group of people, a group of critical thinkers that are then listening to the same radio show on a monthly basis, at least, and often engaging with a lot of other sort of more peripheral content around that, all the networks that had formed. And so when I then realized that, I sort of thought that there's, if we got these people together in person, then you're not having to start the conversation in first gear you're in third, fourth gear. You could potentially use that as a leapfrog and just say there's a common understanding, a common parlance, a common respect here for a what is essentially, I argue, a reformative agenda. And so essentially when, when there was an opportunity knocked where a fellow healthcare company was looking to sponsor a couple of episodes of Physio Matters podcast, particularly they had some data that they felt that they wanted to get attention of our listeners for, and they suggested when I was sort of riffing on what I saw the problems and shortcomings in MSK practice were, particularly in the UK, but I felt that they transcended borders. I then, they then rightly challenged me and said, what would you do about it? And, um, and, and a question that I love, because I suspect that, that in part, they, and they've admitted it since, they sort of thought that, that, was, that I might have been more of a whinger than a doer. Um, but obviously, you know, it's something I'd given more thought to, if anything. And one of those things was get people together and show that this online phenomena isn't just a, a mob. It's actually people that are pragmatically wanting to look towards solutions. So if we get them together, I suspect that a spark will, will, will catch. So that's what we did. And they were willing to support that. They offered, they said, you know, get, we'll do it as a, as a dinner. Maybe we get 15 movers and shakers in a room. And so they gave me an inch and I took a mile and, they, and I put 55 people in a room instead for a whole afternoon. And that was the first one, like, what's that now? 18 months ago, um, I set that up. And obviously that was an inviting event where it was the people that had been volunteering into, well, volunteering feedback and stuff and all our previous guests and stuff like that. And so, um, and, and then the concept was, I thought, what, what unifies people? And generally speaking, it was the argument that we should be holding clinical reasoning to high esteem 
over algorithms or or textbook thinking or suggesting that if we only could map things we could we could get a pathway for everything so instead the the core value that came through all our podcasts was reason so reasoning was the first r the first of the big r's then i realized that well why if that is the clear common denominator why do people end up having dispute and what I found was, as across society, um, the bigger, one of the biggest arguments is how we distribute responsibility between individuals, groups, organizations, society at large, the patients themselves, how we distribute that responsibility is something that is, seem, seems to be the thing that sometimes divides us. So we need to have a mature conversation about that. And then the third thing was, for me, what I think it leads to, which is reform, rather than revolution, it's the idea that we conserve some of the things that are good, that have come out in the analysis, and then reform some of the others. And, and, and so the reform thing had a big question mark behind it initially, but essentially people have tended to agree that when you, were, when you study reason and you study re responsibility, you distribute it appropriately and, and uh, across different disciplines then ref a reformative agenda and consensus emerges that we can then potentially lobby with and gather support for. And as I mentioned before, speak across different boundaries and, and get that out there. So that's, that's the, the philosophy behind it. And we did two invite events, a conference last year, and then it's just growing from there because more people are joining and we're working towards a manifesto now, which is really exciting. Well, that sounds amazing. I can't wait to read that thing. Uh, Jack, does the Charter Society of Physiotherapy gather focus groups of people, uh, you know, like different people like you did for the three R's and conduct something similar on these issues or, or not really? Yeah, well, they've, they've got various different formats and, and the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy in the UK is an interesting organization in that it's got, um, it's got two key arms to it so it's a trade union uh, that we're, that is that is representative of physiotherapists which has a huge perk in many ways because they're very specialized so instead of being part of a healthcare union or a medical union you've actually got reps are physiotherapists or from a physiotherapy tradition and therefore that's a high high benefit but then it's also got this professional arm and this professional wing to it which is the kind of as, as the chartered society suggests it's sort of got a governance standard of sorts but it's a members organization that you become chartered and you become a part of as soon as you graduate with a bachelor's so there's not really it's not a high bar entry level to being chartered so you can imagine between those two wings you've got some, they've got lots of different focus groups, but they've got those two main themes through it. And they aren't uh, totally detached. But generally speaking, I often found myself arguing that you've got the trade union arm is naturally pro-physiotherapy and advocates for that just, just more generally. And it has to go off the premise that, that they are advocating for more physiotherapy because physiotherapy is inherently good. And you've got a professional wing, which essentially, I would argue, could be or should be working towards quality physiotherapy, more good physiotherapy. And so essentially, I've, I, although there's a dispute here, and this is just my opinion, but I'd argue that the, those two things sometimes fight against each other. One is just arguing for, good, for, for more physio, and one's more arguing for more good physio. And so generally the good bit sometimes gets lost in it. So whilst they do have lots of different focus groups and things, the internal politics of a large organization, which has its own challenges, I find that I always found that it was a quite bureaucratic process that didn't really get to it. There was an awful lot of what I call professional correctness that essentially you couldn't really advance the conversation. And as I mentioned at the start, everyone's starting in first gear. You get people around a table, either a literal table or on a conference call or something like that on a focus group. They haven't all been absorbing the same materials and nor should they. And so in a, in a sense, that they always have to start with at least two full days worth of platitudes and understanding each other and all the professional sort of, um, it's an, an essential part of any communication process to sound each other out and feel each other, understand each other. And I get that. But essentially what we were able to do is realize that people have been listening to some of the same material. And whilst there's an argument that that therefore was built from an echo chamber, our material was such that we didn't feel that we had a really narrow scope. We'd actually touched an awful lot of topics. So whilst the CSP do it, yes, we didn't feel that they were doing it in a way that was going to be timely enough or more advanced enough on the conversation to really enact the change that we thought we needed because the time felt like it was now. And so whilst we're involved uh, with the CSP and most of us are CSP members, we've, we've tended to do it as, a, as an, an outside of that, um, as an organization for some of the benefits that being independent can have. 
No, it makes perfect sense. And the reason kind of why we kind of ask that is because it's always interesting to kind of just gather the effects of different professional organizations, because I'm sure there's some differences and similarities between the APTA, the American Physical Therapy Association, compared to the charter, compared to the APA. And it's always just interesting to kind of get what those similarities and differences are, because they do play a role in everything. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Jack, you you mentioned on this a little bit earlier in terms of the event scheduling and the specific and the itinerary. But if we kind of dive in a little bit to those nitty gritty specifics, just to kind of get into kind of how it was actually kind of scheduled from an event standpoint, like how, like what was that specific itinerary looking like and kind of what is it going to look like in the near future if it's going to look any different? Yeah. So the, the, the big event that we'll be talking about really is the, is the conference that came as a, as the third of those events. So um, we did the two invite only events and then we had the, main conference which was last October and so the, the, the key format with that and the reason that was particularly edgy was because we flipped revert we were trusting the caliber of the audience and the conversations so far to realize that we didn't need an hour's, key, an hour's keynote followed by 10 minutes question it was like no we're going to flip that on its head and so we realized that every session was allocated a 90 minute slot and it was split into, into four key parts. So you had a 20-minute keynote introducing the topic from a headline speaker, who then was one of me or my team who, are, who, are con- who conduct interviews all the time and, and really used to scratching beneath the surface of things. They then went up on stage and, and then grilled them for 10 minutes. So it's the, the first couple of questions, almost in a physio matters sort of critical style, would to then sort of scratch at that topic or hold them to account on what they might have said or play devil's advocate so you've got 20 minutes then you've got 10 minutes of my guy on stage or me grilling them then both of those people sit down on a panel with two opposing viewpoints and so you then had the next half hour was as a panel you had one of my team moderating the keynote speaker and then two others that had a unique perspective on these things might have been a debate or there might have been a bit of difference there or it might well have been just another angle like another patient or something like that on the panel rather than a professional so then they do half an hour discussion amongst themselves and sort of teasing that out between them as the crowd watches on using slido to submit questions and then you've got roaming mics for a full room discussion uh, not just q a but a full room discussion for the next half an hour so you've got that then that hour and a half covering a topic um and we and i mean just to give you a few examples on that it was sort of the, the place for manual therapy was it was discussed the uh, pro- appropriate application of the biopsychosocial model was was a, was used the uh, reforming our, our care of sciatica was one of the, the the topics and then you had those as key sessions we had a debate with a um, about the act of orthopedic triage which is a hot topic in the uk so we had a surgeon we had a sports and exercise medical consultant we had a primary care advanced practice physio and then we had a a, a secondary care advanced practice physio so some distinctions between their roles discussing who is best placed to triage things orthopedically so it was just anything that was a hot topic at the time we were giving it the space and the opportunity and getting the voices in the room to really discuss that and then we had the more typically i think we had the breakout workshops which were obviously zooming in on certain issues and, and helping more practical aspects to come forward but as a general rule i'd say that the wor- workshops were probably more standard to a conference whereas that format I, I, I haven't necessarily seen that elsewhere because it really trusts the audience to have an awful lot to say rather than it being tumbleweed when you throw it to questions yeah, Jack, I think uh, almost in like an Oxford debate style uh, here in the U.S., we've got uh, no shortage of audience participation and things to say when it comes to some of these topics. So uh, great job on that. Um, I, I'm curious as to you know how you determined who you were going to specifically invite to get this heterogeneous group of people in different roles in phys- physiotherapy to kind of get the ball rolling. What were some of the characteristics you were looking for? Yeah, well, in the early stages, when it was for these smaller invite only events, it really was more just to do with who had been most prevalent on the feedback loop. 
Um, so when we when we look at who'd been regularly giving us feedback, who'd been the speakers on the podcast, who'd been um, really regularly engaged across various different social media platforms. So that was in the early stages of it. Then when it came to inviting for the speakers and the people that were going to be part key participants at the conference, then that sort of naturally, it bled through those. It was people that had been engaged with the Big R's process then then because it had been 12 months in the making who'd been really hungry to move that forward and also who'd been the biggest critics or skeptics of it who'd been holding it at arm's length wondering which way it was going to go because we really wanted those voices in we didn't want to lose those otherwise we risk that echo chamber so to our, to my mind it was just me and my team which is i've got a brilliant i mean especially because the around this time our apprentices came through as well um, I think as well, we need to try to recognize that the apprentices that we had on came through into the full team around the similar time. And so at that point, we just went all the way over to a, a team of 10. And if you imagine a team, a team of 10, uh, the Physio Matters guys, we're able to then work out who has been most critical, who's been, who's been in the feedback loop, as I mentioned, and therefore who's going to be the key voice that we can bring forward to these panels to make sure or they, you know, and it was quite obvious when we put it all on paper, they agree too much and you'd just be able to tease that out. But then they've both got really good angles, but maybe we could place them on this other panel and things like that. And we had some real household name speakers and then we had some real up and comers that we wanted to give a first platform to. And so it, it was a real nice, the, the, the mixed bag sort of emerged because we are, hopefully we've got our finger on the pulse and we understand not everyone's individual position on everything, but their style and, and, and the, the fact that the audience and the other panelists were always going to be open to that difference. We kind of knew that we could, we could offer a bit of friction, but it was going to be productive friction on each of the panels. And so uh, funnily enough, that was actually an easier process because of the way that the 12 months previous had gone. Um, so if I was starting it from scratch, I think that would be ambitious, uh, but because of the way it emerged, it, it felt very natural. Yeah, that's awesome. What what would you say were some of the key takeaways from the the first real big conference that you did? What what were some of the big take home messages that you found? Yeah, I mean one of the one of the key things is if you you give you give even people that have most famously feel like they disagree on a majority of things, it turns out if they get chance to nuance their positions appropriately and be given each other the space to talk, it turns out that there's more, much more similarity than difference on what a sensible evidence informed consensus can emerge from, especially amongst those individuals. So you've got that heterodoxy, but then essentially there is a true, you know, there's a good 80% there that we could, we could all rally behind, which is why we're then moving towards this manifesto. And so that for me was one of the key take homes. I mean, one of the things there is that there's, um, there's no one in that room seems to be willing to say everything's got a place which just seems to be this temptation for relativism over the idea that there is, a, there is a sweet spot for all sorts of different parts of hocus pocus in the profession. Admittedly, that room is a little, wants to tidy the edges and the fringes of what the profession is in order to have a, a better common identity that we can then move forward in terms of influencing the media, making sure that there isn't super amounts of unwarranted variation, but that we still retain our individual flair. So another thing that came through is this balance of subjectivity and objectivity, which of course is one of the big challenges in our world, full stop. But in MSK Physio, making sure we, we, we are evidence informed, but that we don't lose people in the numbers is this constant tug of war that's going on on every topic we touch. And so I think that was a real common theme that came through it is that it was one of the most mature discussions I've seen that bears that in mind and is appropriately scientific as well as that philosophical overlay that we all want which brings out the detail and makes sure we don't get ideological and carried away on one theme. So that, that was a, a real important feature for me. But as for policy points, the conversation wasn't ready for that yet. Whereas at the next conference that we have in October, which we can be, can be obviously in person and we're getting a bigger venue, but also we're going to have a much more digital presence so people can attend more virtually. That is going to be where we actually have, there are some lines in the sand that have been drawn. There are some policy proposal points that we're going to lobby behind that will be available on our manifesto ahead of the event. And they will be scrutinized in great detail so that then the takeaway messages will be literally set, not quite in tablet or stone, but they'll be there in, in the hard copy ready for us to be scrutinized. 
Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the manifesto, and like I said, I can't wait. But, you know, after the event, what are some other things that have been done, to your knowledge, uh, that maybe these individuals took and, and then went out and implemented the ideas dis- ideas discussed? Did you did you hear any movements or anything that have started? Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a fair amount of different things that the individuals and, and pairs or groups of individuals have then taken forward. And we actually did... But we, there is a document available on reform.physio, which is the website that we try to contain these things on. If you, if you get an account and log into that, you can see that there's actually pledges. Every, every delegate made a pledge, and some of those we tied together, and they went on and, and did things. It's, it's things like there were some cer- certain parts of local activism where they were saying, I will go to my local leisure center and make sure that they understand our access and see if we can host our groups outside of our medical settings so that we're more embedded within the community. There's others that are then said, I, you know, I, I pledged to contact at least five local schools to offer uh, me and my team services to go and have that conversation and to at least make ourselves known to those. These, those were the sorts of um, micro events, and there were plenty of them, uh, as well as some, I will reach out to this institution that I used to work for who have otherwise sort of got a difference of opinion on this to make them aware of our work. But then there were also, we were trying to embed as much as we could within these working groups. So five working groups between governance, excellence, education, evidence, and influence. And so we were trying to find a way to embed those pledges and those, that, that enthusiasm into these working groups that were going to become chapters of the manifesto. So to give you a little clue on that, the governance group is working on things like how can we be better, how can we self-regulate better, and how can we invite a more accurate external regulation between our health, health council in the UK. So that's ongoing. The education fraternity were then working on the, on the chapter for education and reforming education, and then working on a preceptorship model where there's a triad of responsibility between the, the graduating clinician, the institution that employs them, and the institution from which they graduate graduated from, those three are going to be in a responsible way, are going to have a formalized preceptorship program for new graduates between graduating and the third year of practice to bridge that gap between work and play, uh, sorry, for between uh, work and play, so between uh, study and, and then into the real world. Yeah, we have that a lot here in the U.S. where there's kind of that disconnect between the white ivory tower of academia and real actual clinical work where we're getting our hands dirty and we're, you know, we're, we're really trying to show how we educate in the clinical practice. And, and we're trying to bridge that gap and, and, you know, close that disconnect. But it's it's not an easy task we're finding. No, absolutely. And one of the one of the ways that I think we're, we're really going to try to do that is is through this. Again, it's this 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 quite open public but appropriate dialogue where we're demonstrating that no one's putting all the blame or expectation on one particular faction. And it's the idea to reach out to the institutions that from which they qualify and say, look, we think you should have a little more responsibility for your alumni, but we, re- we understand that you can't be the only people doing that. They need to be released for some of their time by their employers who buy into this as long as their time is well spent and it's not abused. And now to the learner themselves, you can't abuse this opportunity. And th- so that's what we're, what we're talking about with the middle R of the big R's is the responsibility needs to be distributed and there needs to be accountability from all factions, which isn't easy. But at this point in time, no one's willing to at least say that we've got to, the, the, the act of trying, we can't keep talking about it. We can't tinker around the edges. We need some reformative change. And there is a hunger for it, we're finding. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just finished my educational doctorate at the end of last year, and I wasn't sold on academia as it stood. So, you know, it it was an internal struggle for me, but it took that that responsibility and that accountability to recognize that I've got to look in, you know, and and that's where some of the podcasts here stemmed from, you know, where we're trying to make changes in healthcare education, and we're trying to do the right things. And uh, you've got to kind of look into yourself at first to take that accountability and realize, all right, well, here's the things I didn't like, here's what I'd like to try to change about it, how to make it a little bit better. And, and, and again, that's, that's where this podcast kind of stemmed from. So Jack, uh, what is the plan for the next three R's event? 
So this time we've 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 got more tangible things that need to be discussed. Um, instead of us just being able to float ideas forever and and have them critiqued in a more general sense, we will have at that point a manifesto for reform that has come through for all the chapters that we mentioned before. And therefore, we want to lace two angles to it. We want some of the theme um, of, or the style that was so successful last year. We want that to carry. And so there's going to be some clinical topics that are again discussed. But there's also going to be in between. Between times, there's going to be sessions where the chapter lead, the author or the working group lead of that of that particular faction, is going to be sat on a panel with a critic of either that work. And by critic, I don't necessarily mean someone who's been scathing of it. I just mean someone who's going to be an external force that's then going to offer a scalpel sharp analysis to that and, and debate some of the policies and proposals that were made. It's not just going to be about unpacking the format of how it came about. That's, that's going to be implied and inferred. And I'll probably be able to introduce that in five minutes at the start. Instead, it's going to be taking a deep dive into each of those chapters. What is it about clinical excellence, for example, that we're going to look to reform and how we will sharpen up the decreasing variation initiative? How, what clinical governance and governance framework across the profession do we advocate? In education, how are we going to go about trying to work out the triad of responsibility thing that we described on a preceptorship. Could we advocate for the syllabus that exists across the physio schools to be public at least so that we can apply some scrutiny and the local clinicians can understand exactly what the school local to them is teaching and then hold them to account for it if they feel that there's any dispute. Those are the sorts of things that are going to come up in sessions, but in between times, we will also have a, a clinical deep dive into something. I mean, we, we're looking at putting together, a, the, is, there a, is there a place for contemporary electrotherapy in, in terms of shockwave, for example? So we get someone in to try and talk about the evidence where it is or isn't and make a, a case for its use in practice or not. We have a, 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 an issue in primary care at the moment called first contact professionals in which essentially physiotherapy is being employed in general practice surgeries as a first line clinician but as if the patient thinks that they're seeing a, a, a GP and essentially it's a physio instead. And there's only some, although we've been doing a lot of self-referred work for a long time across different practices, there is a subtle difference there that needs to be explored. And the conversation is, is fertile and ready to be debated. So that won't necessarily be detached from the conversation around the manifesto, but we also don't want to just keep skirting around the edges. So there'll be a balance between the specifics on scrutiny of each of the chapters, but then also the opportunity that the last conference had to discuss certain issues in broad detail, in quite significant detail as well. Yeah, I love it. And, you know, this next question here uh, really rings true with me because I, I'm of the belief that really physical therapy and physiotherapy is such a great profession, but I, I feel like we can do so much with it. And, and we try to, so at times we're limiting ourselves, but you know, I feel like physical therapy should really only be the tip of our iceberg with all that we can do, you know, and seeing how you've done a lot with the Physio Matters podcast and Choose Health, you know, apart from doing clinical care, you also do some clinical education, some online mentoring. So let's dive into a little bit about specifically what you do for these. What are, you know, some of the, the structures and, and the costs and the things like the ways to expand? What are some other things that you're diving into lately? Yeah, well, what we came to realize was that the central to all of my working philosophy was education. And, and by realizing that, it kind of opened up various different avenues and stopped the, what I felt was an arbitrary separation. So I sit across from someone when I was conducting a Physio Matters interview, and I realized that essentially the person sat in front of me knows things that I don't know. And more often than not, just by being a different human, I know stuff that they don't know. Or my questions, at least, they need to, uh, I can trust my own instincts to ask the right questions, etc. And then I realized that in the next moment, if I then went into another clinic room, and instead I wasn't conducting an interview with a professor, I was actually meeting a patient for the first time, I realized that the same sort of respect needed to be applied in the same way. They know what they know. It's more about them than I know. And I hopefully know something that maybe they don't. And we need to have an appropriately balanced conversation that's respectful to help us come to a common goal, which in this case would be to, to tease out those variables to help understand their case and help them get better. So when I realized that, it kind of travels even further. It travels to then, if, you see, if you've got someone who's got some learning needs in any educational format, then essentially, what are their goals? What are they looking for? Where are their gaps? And how can I help them with what I know? But how can I first find out what they 
what they know and what they want to find out and be, and be better with. So essentially, the, the concept of good conversation just travels well across different disciplines. So if you think about how that maps onto clinical mentoring, what it looks like in our, we want to individualize things. It's very difficult. We can't go a la carte on this because essentially you've got people that have got different goals, different needs, especially depending on what sector they might want to work in or what their ambitions are or what really interests them, be that a body part or a type of practice or they, they really want to, or they're finding themselves tempted to go down a certain school of thought and they, they almost want to, they want to work out whether that's a wise move for them. They're they're kind of they're, they're realizing that their take on biomechanics is being a little either narrow or they find themselves buying in a particular institution or spending their CPD money in a particular direction. And they either want to know whether that's wise or whether it's better spent elsewhere. And so essentially, we, we I know I'm giving a general answer, but it's kind of instead of there being a menu, it's kind of what are your specific needs? And then can we, can we pair you with one of my highly skilled team to actually do some clinical mentoring? So it individualizes your CPD. So essentially, it's instead of going on a course and potentially, I mean, even on the very best course, you're going to get 30% of it that might not necessarily land with you or it's stuff you already knew. In a one-to-one -one mentoring situation, especially with the technology we now, now have over Zoom or Skype or FaceTime, WhatsApp, the ability for us to, to get into the detail and even do practical sessions in that format, although not perfect, but you can do demonstrations and stuff, then essentially we, we're using technology to make sure we individualize CPD where necessary. It doesn't mean that conferences, courses, etc., cetera, aren't, aren't valid, but where possible, sometimes people just want their questions answered. And especially what Physio Matters did is it give us the example of how we approach those interviews in a very similar way to how we approach everything in our practice. And so if, for, for clinical mentoring, that essentially we can be paid by the hour, much like a clinician would be paid by the hour by the people that want them to see their bad knee. So people who've gone with their function is someone that's got a problem with their educational needs Essentially, if you feel that we're, we're the, if we're the people that you want to trust with either of those things, then this is how much it costs an hour. Or if you want a package of care, of course, that, that's what we could do. Now, in a clinical circumstance, we, we don't tend to do that. Apart from in, say, ACL injury or polytrauma, we could do a package of care because you can sort of have a bit more of a prognosis, whereas obviously we don't do that with general conditions. But when it comes to educational needs or mentoring, someone says, I'm looking to try and achieve this over six months, then that's the sort of thing we can, we can price for. And some of it's by the hour and some of it's just anticipating on a pack price. So it does tend to, it does tend to just vary a little bit on that just to, do, just to make sure we individualize it. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Uh, what are some of the common themes or general trends that you're finding um, that maybe there's some misconceptions or, or holes in the education? What, what do people have the most difficulty with and the biggest problems that you see over and over again that are coming to you for, for answers for some of these mentorship uh, opportunities? Yeah, I think one of the, the biggest one, and it's a, it's a good problem for us to have. I think a lot of the problems that we, we, we have in physiotherapy, I consider to be archaic sort of yesteryear problems that we're really struggling to reform. Whereas this problem I'm going to mention as a primary one in education for who comes to us, this is a good problem for us to have. And it's that a lot of people have had a bit of a world, the, the, the world has moved from under them in understanding the application of education, communication with your patient, understanding what to say, what not to say, the style in which you should say it or not say it. Um, people recognizing that there are consequences to structural or biomechanical language, especially in a certain cohort of people. They're realizing that essentially the... Um, the things that they used to understand as to what tools they had in their armory, at least the mechanisms behind the application of those tools are at least more being more questioned means that they are then in a situation where they recognize that they need to upskill in a communication application. That's a good problem to have. But the gap is that whilst people have recognized that, and there's some great teaching and some great advocacy and great papers that can be read on that, the application of it, when society at large hasn't moved as quick as the profession has on this education front, quite understandably, by the way, you know, and the, and the, and the fact that the media is not shifting in a similar rate, or there's been a, an arguably a revolution occurred, particularly when it comes to our understanding of how neuroscience meets biomechanics, for example. It's like, a, and it's not the only thing as well, but that is 
a real there's a real gap that needs to be bridged. So a clinician can have a real good concept of what sort of care they want to give, but the actual delivery of that is incredibly challenging. And so what we find ourselves doing most is reaching out to clinicians who kind of get it, or they feel like the pennies dropped to their understanding of it in the most part, although you can sharpen up neuroscience. Any of us can keep learning that. I certainly learn all the day, all the time on that. But the application of it, how to communicate to the patient. So when is it appropriate? Or even when when is um, not structuralism, not the narrow analysis of someone's structure, but when is it when is it particularly important? Or when should we be very specific with our exercise prescription? When can we get away with being more general? And it's all about that application to the individual in front. So we do an awful lot of case study work. We, we try not to overgeneralize, but bring, allow the uh, mentees to bring specific cases that they want to discuss, but also uh, make sure that we, we tend to split our sessions. If we're doing a two-hour mentoring session, it tends to be half of it is, say, covering a topic, you know, be, be that. And it might even be, depending on someone's level of, of study, it might just be like, let's talk about the ankle, be that basic sort of anatomy, physiology. You don't have to be basic, but just general or pathologies, common pathologies. And then we might, for the next part, apply that on a case study or, or ideally one that they've brought. So we try and get that balance. But the key one is that people are increasingly getting it, which I said is a good problem. But the gap to actually applying it in practice is still significant, partly for the reasons you mentioned before, where there is a gap between education in institutional sense and the workplace. Yeah, we've had a handful of uh, guests from the UK on now. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to ask this question um, just out of, uh, out of a, you know, a little bit of uh, naivety. But, uh, really? you know, does physiotherapy school in the UK adequately prepare students to become optimal independent clinicians? Why do you think so or, or why not? Yeah, I would say I would say not at the at the moment. I think not through lack of training, and I'm and I'm very aware. And I don't want to. I don't say this as an empty platitude because it's something I'm actually okay. I'm against empty platitudes for the sake of it. But I really do mean it when I say that there's a, an awful lot of faculty staff that are out there really trying to do that, including those that are helping us to reform MSK education and inferring that by being part of that movement, they're understanding that it needs more than just a few tinkers around the edges. Um, and so, yeah, I would say it does. I think. It's, I think it's better than some places and, and worse than others. There's a huge variation that occurs between schools, and that's one of the big problems. So if you took the best, the best, um, most progressive schools, you would argue in the evidence sense um, are in the UK that um, if that was if that was the, the the common model, the framework, the blueprint that was being used across across the all the physio schools, I'd be out of a job uh, as a as a as a critic as an analyst really because they're doing some great work, and so there's some real benchmark standards that could be used there but if you look at the whole the variation is quite significant and we see that significantly when people come into practice when we see them on placement or we see them as new graduates they, they are sort of lacking in certain areas um as for the as for the why that is that's very, that's very complex i think the systems in which these people work especially the educational staff work is very challenging getting the right balance between academic intellectuals and the practicing clinicians not that there's a there should be a, always a distinction obviously you want people with a, a hand in both camps but those that have studied for 10 years to do several different postdoc projects are still inc they're incredible people to be teaching you about say tendons for example if that's where their work's been the fact that they might not have seen a patient or seen as many patients as a full-time clinician is, is inevitable so we need to find a balance between that but as a general rule, you definitely don't want people that have become too clinically distant from the specific and demographic challenges that come from working in frontline MSK practice. And that is incredibly challenging because as soon as you, part of the big challenge in MSK practice, especially in the UK, is the fact that even people like me, who's not now a full-time clinician, because I'm, I'm running a business and I have other factions, as you know, through education, the podcast, etc., means that even if I don't keep in touch with those that are, do, that are seeing patients all day, every day, then even I become sufficiently detached to be out of the loop on the pressures. Because one of the pressures is the literal pressure of monotony. And I don't mean that in a disrespectful way to the patients, but I just mean that there's, you can have a list that is back-to-back -back persistent low back pain. And essentially, if, you've not, if you lose touch with what that means or you don't speak to the clinicians enough that are in that grind at that point in their career, 
You're never going to be empathizing enough with them. And I think that that is where MSK education in our institutions at the moment is lacking is because there's just, there's an upper limit to empathy because there's a miscommunication going on. There's a detachment between this utopian what physio could be sterile environment of, of, of working compared to the harsh reality, unfortunately, that exists and the difficulties we have in society across multiple morbidities and all that other stuff that means that essentially that disconnect needs to be, well, that, that gap needs to be bridged. Um, I think we can do that. Obviously, I'm a, an, an optimist more generally with what we've got going on at the moment, but um, I do think there's a way to go, particularly in education. Yeah, you bring up a lot of great points there, Jack. I mean, we, we deal with uh, a lot of that here in the U.S. between variability amongst programs, um, you know, the monotony cause, causing and, and leading to burnout, uh, clinician burnout, you know, and, and like you said, there are some good people out there doing some really good things to try to address this. So I'm right there with you. I'm an optimist. I'm hopeful. Uh, I do think we've got a, a little ways to go still, but uh, I think, you know, due to the likes of people like you and, and Zach Gabar and, and some other people out there that are doing really good things to try to move the needle. There is hope, I think. So, so at the very least, uh, you know, there, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We just need to keep pushing toward it. I think, you know, if you could send just one message to all physiotherapy educators, administrators, um, what's one big message you would like them to hear? What's something you'd like to resonate with them? I think, um, to, to, to be, I'd always pick a broad one just because I think it'd be something that can get most reach. But generally speaking, I, I want them to try and really scrutinize what they don't know and who are they speaking to that helps them to bridge that gap. So based on the thing I just said on the last question is that I think that it's generally teaching staff and faculty and academics generally, they're kind of used to asking them that self that question. The concept of a null hypothesis is fairly comfortable to them, but they're not necessarily applying it to the pragmatics of the work environment. They can understand the constituent parts of what is challenging in MSK practice on the, fr on the front line. But they're, they're, even if they just dabble with it, even if they're seeing, clinicians, seeing patients two, three times a week, say if they've got a dual role, the fact that they've got that split is often a relevant difference. And so what I, what I would say is, what don't you know? What is it you're missing? Especially if you feel that there's people that are making noises that you just think are being totally unreasonable. Try where possible to extend and be ambitious at what you can empathize with. And if you're struggling to understand it, find someone to ask. Obviously, there's people out there that are awkward and, and, and aren't necessarily as forthcoming as we'd hope they'd be. But where possible, there's often people and groups, including ours, that are helping to do that, that are helping to add clarity and shine a light. doesn't mean you'll then agree with them, by the way, but at least you'll be able to account for those variables. And that's what I most want. And so if I was to ask them, tell them one thing in summary, it is, what don't you know? And how are you correcting for that? And ideally, if your how involves a person or a group that's going to clarify that rather than it being a textbook or a paper that you read. If you can help, if someone else helps the penny to drop, that relationship is what we're all about. Cause obviously I'm the pro conversation guy. I think it can solve a lot of problems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, I, I just finished the EDD, um, the educational doctorate there in December uh, of last year. And after finishing that, I realized how much I didn't know which that was the first time where I really took a little time to self, you know, reflect and, and really do some introspection and, and realize that, man, I still have a lot I need to learn. <laughs> so, so I think, uh, I'm not, I'm not pushing for terminal degrees. I'm not saying everybody needs to go out and get one. I'm just saying that, uh, if, if you decide to go down that track, uh, you will realize that there is a lot more to learn. There's always a lot more to learn. So, uh, you know, keep pushing, you know, we want everybody to be lifelong learners for sure. I think that's just a big helpful tip moving forward. Thanks again so much for all your time and for coming on here. We like to ask all of our guests this one final question. If you could change one aspect of healthcare education, whether it be physio or, or otherwise, what aspect would you change and how would you go about changing it? I would, um, and, and it's very difficult because dip, depending on different schools and factions, this might not be that radical a change, whereas in other places it would be. But I would put, and it's almost a cliche that I would say this, but I would put conversation at the heart of education, regardless of where it is. And, and by conversation, I don't necessarily mean overt debate. 
I just mean the fact that however someone's learning, they need to be able to articulate that because that is the interface that at the moment we deal with our patients with and we deal with each other with. And so we need to find a way to better articulate what we understand at every level of analysis rather than it being learn, 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 then articulate. It almost needs to be as we go, we're always trying to clarify. And then once you feel like you're grasping it, you're finding someone else who's got a different opposition, opposing viewpoint or someone of a different uh, professional background, uh, especially uh, obviously with cross-party working, different allied health professionals or other students from other courses. That for me would be would be really useful. Obviously, you, you don't want to water everything down and people do worry that that would be too too much time away from some of the... There are some hard skills that need to be learned with regards to understanding anatomy, physiology, pathology. Um, and understanding biomechanics, I think, is, is a useful thing as well with regards to just harder physics processes and learning the evidence. But if, if where possible, you can lace a conversational element into it, I think it does offer a corrective to an awful lot of things. And whilst not easy, even for people that aren't conversationalists or aren't, don't find that a particularly easy thing, it is the harsh reality as it exists in healthcare is that the human interface is still key. And so whilst that happens, even if it's a bit anxiety inducing to do sort of case studies or to do role plays um, where necessary, that is the actual modality that you're going to be using to share and persuade behavior change. So where possible, I would just lace that through as much as possible. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I mean, communication really is is so key, and and I think uh, storytelling is is really one of the ways that we we learn. You know, that's how we transfer knowledge. And I think just communication and being able to to have those conversations is so important. Not even in healthcare. I think just in human to human interaction. So I think it's a great answer. Um, but Jack, again, I can't thank you enough for your time and for coming on the podcast today. Um, where can people find you online and on social media if they want to follow up or if they have any questions about three R's or anything like that? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm usually pretty, pretty easy to find across social media. My personal platform being on Twitter, usually uh, Jack, I think Jack, I should know this, shouldn't I? At Jack A. Chu. Um, we, we changed it because obviously we used to use our business handle at TPM podcast on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, I tend to also, we, we, we have uh, Facebook pages for Physio Matters and Choose Health. If you want to pay attention to our private practice, that's where we put out an awful lot of public facing information, but the interprofessional information tends to be across Physio Matters, podcast feeds, social medias, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, but then also follow the big R's, which is hashtag the big RS. Uh, which being, of course, the three ones being reason and responsibility and reform. The big conference is going to be, if tickets are on sale now and uh, the early bird tickets are available, I was explaining that we're going to make, uh, make you a discount code for the first 10 of your listeners that might fancy coming along and w- coming to a virtual attendance of our conference in October. And you go to www.buytickets.at forward slash reforming MSK, or you just visit reform.physio sign up on there and get updates on that. So reform.physio forward slash conference, that will have all the information on it. And um, and usually the best way to keep in touch with actual themes is to follow the hashtag because it's been getting hundreds of millions of impressions, which is rather intense and it's turning heads and it's making real waves across different parts, not just in our sector, but also it's making impacts into policy, into politics and beyond. So I'm glad it's having an influence and you can influence it too. Yeah, and we'll put all those links in the show notes for all of our listeners. Uh, You know, Jack, can't thank you enough for extending that discount to the first 10 people that sign up. Um, It's been an absolute pleasure, man. I hope to, uh, to, to get to share a beer with you at some point. Absolutely. No, it'd be a pleasure for sure. Thanks for having me and uh, keep doing all the great work you're doing. The more sharing, the more caring. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. 
If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.